Welcome to the deep dive. Today we're uh, getting to a condition that's probably more common than you know than many people realize: hydrogenitis superativa, often called acne inversa. Yeah. Exactly, and we want to explore what really drives this chronic inflammatory skin issue. You know, those recurring painful nodules, almost like abscesses, and these pus-filled tracts that show up in well tricky areas like armpits, under the breasts, the groin. Yeah, those intertriginous areas, and the impact is huge. We're talking pain, itching. Yeah. Sometimes odor, discharge, it really affects quality of life. Seriously. The sources mention it's comparable to things like stroke, diabetes, even severe COPD in terms of life impact. It's not trivial. Absolutely not. And for this deep dive, we're drawing on some really good material from the Derma Immunology Dr. Nagla Elmongi YouTube channel. Mm. Two specific videos. Right. What are they? Well, the first one, exploring the pathogenesis of hydronitis aperitiva, really digs into the molecular side, the immune stuff, based on a 2023 paper. Mm -hmm. And the second, factors behind female sex bias in hydronitis aperitiva looks at why it seems to affect women more often, also from a 2023 publication. Great sources. So our mission today for you listening is to pull out the key insights from these. We want to get a clearer picture of what's actually happening in HS and uh, tackle that question of the female predominance based on what dermatologists understand right now. Sounds good. OK, so let's jump right in. Pathogenesis first. What's kicking this whole thing off? Well, the big picture is that it's multifactorial. It's not just one thing. Yeah. Meaning you've got a mix of genetic predisposition. Something like 35% of people with HS have a family history. Okay. Environmental factors like smoking, obesity, mm. hormonal influences play a role. Mm. And then there's this uh, significant immune system dysfunction involved in both starting it and keeping it going. So it's a convergence, really. Exactly. A confluence of factors. So if it's this mix, what's the sort of initial spark? Yeah. The trigger? The main thinking, the hypothesis, is that these factors together activate the innate immune system, the body's first responders. Right. This leads to inflammation right around the hair follicles, cur follicular inflammation. Okay. And that inflammation causes a couple of things, hyperkeratosis, which is like a thickening of the skin layer, and hyperplasia, more cells growing in the lining of the follicle opening, the infundibula. So essentially, the follicle opening gets clogged up and kind of overgrown. You got it. That blockage <laughs> leads to the follicle swelling up, dilating, and eventually it ruptures. Ah, OK. And that rupture is the big problem. That seems to be a key event. The rupture unleashes everything inside the follicle, and that triggers a really strong inflammatory immune response. Mm. You get immune cells, neutrophils, macrophages, T cells, especially Th1 and Th17 types, flooding into the skin. And that's what causes the nodules and abscesses we see. Precisely. That infiltration of immune cells drives the formation of those painful lesions. It sounds like a whole chemical soup of inflammation is involved then. Lots of signals flying around. Absolutely. These immune cells release a cocktail of pro-inflammatory cytokines. Think of them as messenger molecules stirring things up. Like which ones? Oh, IL-1 beta, IL-6, CXCL8, which is also called IL-8, IL-12, IL-23, IL-17A, IL-36. Quite a list. And the sources really emphasize a strong Th17 profile in HS. Th17, okay. Yeah, and T cells, along with dendritic cells, are central here. They produce IL-23 and IL-12, and those cytokines really push towards that Th17 response and also encourage the skin cells, the keratinocytes, to multiply too much. And IL-23 stimulates the Th17 cells, you said. Right. IL-23 basically tells Th17 cells, okay, produce IL-17, and then IL-17 floods into the HS lesions. You know, IL-17, Th17, th those sound familiar. They pop up in other inflammatory conditions too, don't they? Good point. Yes, they do. The IL-17 family is really significant in things like psoriasis, other autoimmune auto-inflammatory diseases, but it's tricky because IL-17 also has a protective role. You know, it helps fight off bacteria and fungi by boosting antimicrobial peptides in the skin. So it's like a defense mechanism that's gone haywire in HS, contributing to the inflammation instead of just protecting. That's a really good way to put it, yeah. And you see this playing out because in HS, both in the lesions themselves and the skin right around them, levels of these cytokines are elevated. TNF-alpha is a big oh, one. Oh, which is why anti-TNF drugs are used, right? Exactly. As HS progresses, TNF-alpha, IL-1-beta, IL-17-A, another molecule called caspase-1, and even IL-10 all tend to increase. This just recruits more immune cells, neutrophils, mast cells, monocytes that turn into macrophages and dendritic cells. It fuels the fire. Okay, now this auto-inflammatory idea and nets 
Neutrophil extracellular traps. What's that about? It sounds complicated. It is fascinating. There's a mounting evidence for this auto-inflammatory piece in HS. It involves these nets. So neutrophils, a type of white blood cell, can release these sort of sticky webs. Mm -hmm. They're made of DNA, proteins mm -hmm. like histones, and Webs like traps. Kind of, yeah. Hence the name. In HSs, it looks like the immune system starts reacting against these nets and the stuff stuck in them. This misguided attack seems to contribute to the ongoing inflammation and immune system going off track. So the body's attacking its own debris almost. In a sense, yes. And remember, IL-17A, from those Th17 cells, it helps bring neutrophils into the tissue, which yeah. then release these nets, contributing to damage. What's really interesting is that neutrophils from HS patients seem to just spontaneously form nets more easily. Wow. But their blood serum isn't great at breaking these nets down. So you find these net forming neutrophils inside those tunnels in HS lesions, and the amount of nets actually correlates with how severe the HS is. A direct link? Seems like it. Plus, they've found autoantibodies antibodies attacking the body's own stuff, targeting proteins found in these nets in HS patients. It really looks like a self-perpetuating cycle. That's Yeah, that's a lot going on under the skin. What about bacteria? You hear abscess, you think infection. Is that the main driver? That's the million-dollar question, really. It's still debated. You definitely find bacteria in HS lesions, common ones like Staph aureus, Strep, others like Proteus, and anaerobes, too. But is it chicken or egg? Did the bacteria cause it, or did they just move in once the inflammation started? Exactly. It's not clear if they're the primary cause or more like secondary invaders that make the existing inflammation worse. And what about those samples from lymph nodes after surgery? Does that shed any light? It suggests bacteria are definitely involved in the chronicity. When they look at lymph nodes draining the affected areas, they often find things like staph epidermidis, corynebacterium, sometimes less common ones like Klebsiella or Enterococcus. This supports the idea that bacterial superinfection in existing lesions helps keep that chronic inflammation going. The source has also mentioned something I didn't expect a link to periodontitis, gum disease. Yeah, it's surprising, right? Cool. But some research suggests that the types of bacteria that cause gum disease are found more often in people with HS. It raises the question of whether you know oral health and the bacteria in your mouth could somehow influence HS. It definitely needs more investigation, but it's an interesting potential link. Okay, so with all this immune stuff and bacteria potentially playing a role, antibiotics make sense as a treatment. But you mentioned resistance. Yeah, that's the concern. Antibiotics are used a lot, partly because they kill bacteria, but also maybe because they have some anti-inflammatory effects themselves, modulating T cells. But with antibiotic resistance rising everywhere, there's a real push for more precise treatments. Guided by testing, you mean? Ideally, yes. Yeah. Knowing which bacteria are there. And another complicating factor is biofilms. Biofilms? Yeah, basically bacteria creating these protective, slimy layers. Yeah. Studies show a high percentage, like almost 90% of staph epidermidis from HS lesions can form strong biofilms. That makes it much harder for antibiotics to clear out. Right. So where are we heading with treatments then, beyond antibiotics and anti-TNFs? Research is really digging into the molecular pathways now. By looking at what molecules are present in HS tissue, scientists are identifying new targets. We already know blocking TNF-alpha, IL-1, and IL-17 works for some people. So building on that. Exactly. Promising new targets are emerging. Things like IFN-gamma, IL-6, IL-23, which we talked about earlier, C5A, which is part of the complement system, and the JAK-STAT pathway, which is involved in cytokine signaling. So more targeted therapies. That's the goal. The future is likely personalized medicine using biomarkers, maybe to predict who will respond to what, using pharmacogenomics to tailor treatment to your specific genetic makeup. It definitely sounds like we're piecing together this complex immunological puzzle, but maybe the exact picture, the starting point, is still a bit fuzzy. That sums it up well. It's clearly a complex immunological condition. Lots of inflammatory players involved. The success of some targeted drugs gives us big clues, but the precise sequence, the very first domino to fall, that's still not fully pinned down. Okay, really fascinating some of the how. Let's shift gears now to the who, or rather the why more women. Our sources pointed out this pretty stark female predominance, especially in North America and Europe, like three women for every one man affected. It is a significant imbalance, and it echoes what we see in some classic autoimmune diseases like lupus, Sjogren's, systemic sclerosis. They also predominantly affect women. Right. Now, HS is generally classed as auto-inflammatory, not autoimmune, but 
The thinking is that similar underlying immune mechanisms, these sex-based differences in immunity, might be contributing to why more females get HS. So what are those potential differences? The sources broke it down into intrinsic and extrinsic factors. Yeah, basically biological differences inherent to being male or female versus external environmental factors. Let's start with the intrinsic, the biological stuff. Okay, so one aspect is differences in the immune system development itself. Biological females tend to have a higher production rate of T cells from the thymus gland. Where T cells mature, right. Exactly. So potentially a larger pool of T cells overall. Females also tend to have proportionally more B cells, the antibody makers, while males often have more NK cells and monocytes. And generally speaking, both innate immunity, that first response, and the antibody-based humoral immunity tend to be stronger, more robust in females. Hmm. And how might that relate to HS? Well, while we don't have a specific antigen identified in HS, like in classic autoimmunity, those innate and humoral responses are heavily involved in HS pathology. So a generally stronger baseline response in females could potentially predispose them. Makes sense. And then the obvious one, hormones. Absolutely. This is a big area. Many women report that their HS onset or flare-ups correlate with hormonal changes, puberty, their menstrual cycle, pregnancy, even menopause. So a strong clinical link. Very suggestive, yes. Sex hormones, estrogens, and androgens directly influence immune cells through various receptors. Animal studies show females often mount stronger Th1-type immune responses, and certain T cells from females tend to multiply more and pump out more interferon gamma, a key inflammatory cytokine, compared to male cells. And estrogen seems particularly implicated. It does. Estrogen has complex effects. It can boost the survival and growth of immune cells like T and B cells, and it cranks up the production of cytokines, especially that interferon gamma. Certain levels of estrogen seem to directly push towards a Th1 response. So the higher IFN gamma seen in female HS lesions, estrogen might be partly responsible. Okay, but what about androgens? Testosterone and related hormones, we link those to things like acne. That's a really crucial point, too. HS is linked with conditions associated with androgens, like acne vulgaris and PCOS. And interestingly, there are reports of HS starting or worsening in transgender men receiving testosterone therapy. Oh. Yeah. Plus, studies find more androgen receptors on skin cells in HS lesions, and genes controlled by androgens seem more active there. Now, while androgens are sometimes seen as immunosuppressive, one way they could fuel HS inflammation is by potentially enhancing Th17 responses, leading to more IL-17. Another key cytokine we discussed. Right. And adding to the complexity, some HS patients report improvement with antiandrogen drugs like spironolactone or certain birth control pills. So it's not straightforwardly estrogen bad, androgen good, or vice versa. Definitely not. It seems to be about the complex interplay, the relative balance between estrogens and androgens, and how that balance or imbalance disrupts the immune system. Got it. So it's the dynamic interaction. Precisely. And these hormones also influence innate immunity, including that NLRP3 inflammasome we mentioned earlier. Remind me what that does. It's like an alarm sensor inside cells. It detects danger signals and triggers the release of very potent inflammatory cytokines, IL-1 beta and IL-18. Okay. Now, there's some evidence maybe more from non-skin conditions, but still relevant, suggesting androgens might directly trigger this inflammasome. That could potentially explain why testosterone therapy might worsen HS. And we do see signs of inflammasome activation, more IL-1 beta, more NLRP3, more caspase-1 activity in HS lesions. So hormones affecting this inflammasome differently in males and females could contribute to the sex difference in HS. It's a very plausible mechanism that needs more research how exactly different hormones impact inflammasome activation and immune cell activity in the context of HS specifically is still being worked out. Okay, another intrinsic factor mentioned was X chromosome dosage, females XX, males XY. How does that potentially play into immunity in HS? Right, so biological females have two X chromosomes. One gets mostly inactivated early on, but crucially not completely. Some genes escape inactivation. Exactly, maybe around 15%. And the X chromosome carries a lot of immune-related genes. Some that escape in activation include TLR7 and TLR8. These are receptors that detect viral RNA, basically, and trigger inflammatory signals, including type 1 interferon. Higher TLR78 activity due to this incomplete inactivation in females is thought to contribute to female bias in lupus, for instance. So potentially in HS2, 
that extra dose of certain immune genes from the second X could contribute to sustained inflammation. That's the hypothesis. It's about gene dosage effects potentially tipping the immune balance. And it's not just the genes themselves, but how they're regulated, epigenetics. Yes, absolutely. The inactivation process involves things like DNA methylation. There are examples like in lupus T cells from females where specific methylation patterns lead to higher expression of the CD40 ligand gene, which promotes inflammation. So epigenetic differences tied to the X chromosome could also be playing a role in sex-biased immunity relevant to HS. Wow. Beyond hormones and the X chromosome, are there other sex-biased genes involved? Yes. Some immune-related genes located on other chromosomes also show different expression levels between sexes, seemingly independent of direct hormonal control or being on the X chromosome. VGLL3 is one example mentioned. VGLL3. It's a transcription cofactor more active in female skin, and it seems to switch on pro-inflammatory and interferon response genes. It's been linked to autoimmunity. Others like BAFF, MMP9, even IL-17 itself, and ICAM-1 sometimes show higher expression in female biased autoimmune conditions. So there might be other uh, sex-specific regulators controlling inflammation in HS that we're still discovering. Okay, so a really deep, complex web of intrinsic biological factors. What about the extrinsic stuff? Environment, lifestyle, the microbiome came up. Right. The microbiome, the communities of bacteria, fungi, viruses living on us and in us is huge now in health research. And there's evidence it influences sex-specific immunity. How so? Well, the skin microbiome differs between males and females. This might be down to differences in hormone metabolism in the skin, sweat rates, skin pH, even things like sebum production effect, which microbes thrive. And we know the skin microbiome is altered in HS. Exactly. So you have an altered microbiome in HS, and you have underlying immune differences between sexes. How do those two interact? Could the female-biased immune system react differently? maybe more strongly, to certain microbiome shifts. It's plausible it could feed into that Th1, Th17 inflammation. Potential feedback loop. Could be. And then there's the gut microbiome, too. Also different between sexes. Yes, and it plays a massive role in training our immune system. Altered gut microbiomes are linked to things like Crohn's disease, psoriasis, conditions sometimes associated with HS. Hmm. Given the links between HS and diet, obesity, metabolic syndrome, the gut microbiome angle seems very relevant, too. Some small studies show differences in HS patients, but we need bigger studies to see if sex-related immune factors and gut microbiome changes really intersect to drive HS. Still lots to learn there. Okay, finally, smoking. A known risk factor. Any sex-specific angle here? This is interesting because it might help explain geographic differences. Mm -hmm. While North America and Europe see that 3.1 female-to-male ratio, right. some studies from Asia have actually reported a male bias, maybe one female to two males. Really? The opposite? Yeah. And that likely reflects environmental factors, including different smoking prevalence between men and women in those populations, maybe interacting with different genetic backgrounds, too. So how does smoking potentially impact HS differently based on sex or just in general? Well, smoking generally is linked to higher white blood cell and neutrophil counts in HS patients. Chemicals in smoke affect pathways like the aryl hydrocarbon receptor, which is implicated in chronic skin inflammation. One chemical, benzoaparine, can actually increase Th17 cells and IL-17 production key players in HS. Uh, another direct link to that pathway. Seems so. And nicotine itself might disrupt skin metabolism in ways we don't fully understand yet. So, the smoking link is strong. And differences in smoking rates, or perhaps subtle differences in how male and female bodies process the smoke components and react immunologically, could contribute to those varying sex ratios globally. So it really underscores that conclusion. The female sex bias isn't down to one thing, it's this complex mix. Exactly. Hormones, genetics, including the X chromosome, and other genes. Environmental factors like smoking, the microbiome. They all seem to interact and shape the immune system differently in males and females, contributing to this pattern we see in HS. This has been, wow, a really comprehensive look at such a challenging condition. We've unpacked so much about the immune system's role, the hormonal influences, genetics, environment. It's quite the aha moment seeing how all these threads, especially the sex-specific factors, might weave together. Absolutely. And it's important for everyone listening to remember, as much as we've covered, our understanding is still evolving. There's still questions. You know, science is constantly digging deeper and figuring out all the intricacies of HS is definitely an ongoing journey. For sure. And maybe that leads to a final thought for you to ponder. Given those strong hormonal links we discussed, 
What could future treatments look like if they could really target those pathways more precisely, maybe differently depending on the individual, regardless of their biological sex? And beyond smoking, what other environmental factors might be lurking, playing a bigger role than we currently realize? Definitely food for thought. Indeed. Thanks for joining us for this deep dive.